Uh, hi everyone, welcome to my science journey. Today we are honored to be hosting Dr. Chiara Battini. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, and hello everybody. You're still loading up the slides, you could tell us a fun fact about you. Sure. Uh, yeah. so, the, so whenever I have to tell a fun fact to people, the, the one that comes to mind is that, um, so apparently the day I was born, there was an earthquake in Rome where I was Ooh. born. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so yeah, so what a way to arrive in the world. And the funny thing about it is that my grandma and my auntie were in the lift when that happened. And so they didn't feel the earthquake. And so when they came out at the floor where I was, everybody was running about and they were like, just what is going what on? <laughs> so wow. yeah, so that is a, that is a story that of like every single birthday in my life, my family has told me that there was an earthquake <laughs> the day I was born, which is like, I got, I think I got it by now. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't, and also, we don't have many earthquakes in Rome, so it's quite a rare mm. event. So a landmark, um, that was like, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're coming to make <laughs> a heavy contribution yeah. in the world. So The world does notice me arriving, definitely. Give you a bit of a an overview of where how my journey went, because it's a journey of between disciplines and between wow. different geographical locations as well. So I, I've made some slides to try and remind myself what were the important parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a degree in 2004 in Italy. At that time, we didn't have a, differ a, a separation between BSc and MSc in mm. Italy. So it was a single five years degree, which we call laurea. And that was in biological sciences, but it, you could choose what to do in the last two years. So it was almost like a master at the end of it. Um, and so I specialized in population and evolutionary biology. So I'm not a medical doctor at all. Like I don't have any clinical background at all. And uh, what I worked on was to use um, the variation in mitochondrial DNA to understand the history of two Central African populations. Um, mostly because during my universities, I got really fascinated about human evolutionary history. And I didn't know at the time that we all originated in Africa. And that was mind blowing in that moment for me. And so I wanted to understand more about it. And so I found someone in Rome who was working on this and I joined their lab. Um, but what I also did, so the lab is on the left. That is my faculty in Rome. And I think it still looks exactly the same uh, 20 years later. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, things don't change very quickly in, in my city. Um, and then what I did was also going for my more experimental work and kind of master project, I went to Barcelona in the lab that is on the right, which is a lot fancier. Um, and that is a group at the Universitat Pompeo Fabra, who was working um, very much on using genetics to understand population history in various places in the world. Um, before doing that, I also did six months Erasmus Day in Ghent, in Belgium. So it, it is really during my degree that I started having that kind of international dimension that was really important, I think, to open up way, like different ways of thinking, uh, both from a professional and personal perspective. And uh, I was lucky enough to kind of wrapping up the work I did during my degree, and I published it three, three years later, as you can see there. So that's one figure taken from that paper. And the reason because why it is three years later is because my supervisor at the time told me, well, you know, so far I've always written papers for my students, but I think it's time I stop doing that. So you are the first student that will, will try and learn doing that on their own. And I'm like, oh, what, what a good timing to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. So it was a long process. And maybe in that moment, I wasn't very grateful that he decided to do that. But on the long run, I'm actually quite grateful because I really learned a lot about writing papers on that very first <laughs> attempt. So <clears throat> right after my degree, I started a PhD, which I ended in 2008. 
And I did that PhD with one supervisor in Rome and one supervisor in Barcelona. So my link with Barcelona got a lot stronger. I spent months and months and months in Barcelona during my PhD. Um, and I continued working on the peopling of Central Africa. And I continued working on mitochondrial DNA, but also on Y chromosome variation. So I brought in that kind of sex biased element uh, on understanding the history of these populations. Yes, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious because your PhD is called Animal Biology, but then yes. you are you are focusing on you know the peopling of Central Africa. So how is that? You know. Yeah. So I was in the department about animal biology, but mm. at the time, so we were like an, an anthropology group within a department of animal biology. So looking at humans very much as an animal species rather than a cultural species. So looking very much at kind of migration dynamics, um, sex bias processes, how climate influence distribution of populations and that kind of thing, with the caveat that humans are cultural animals anyways, right? So you have language that comes in, you have tools making that come into the play, like, so they're not, so they have, of course, a, a cultural dimension. But, you know, the interesting thing about this is that when I joined that anthropology team, I did an, uh, an exam with, what, with who then became my supervisor. Um, and the, the first question he asked me at that exam was, can you define culture? Uh, and, and being a biologist, I thought, well, you know, we always think of culture as a very human uh, characteristic, but actually, to me, culture is anything that is passed through generations that is not biological, really. And that is not specific to humans, actually, if you think about it. So it was very interesting to be in that environment. Um, oh, yeah, although there were not many other people who were doing the same thing. <laughs> so I heard a lot about ecological studies. Um, not a lot of people were using genetics either, so maybe not quite the best. But because I was in two places, I could really make the best out of the situation. So, um, right. So, yeah, so I did my PhD in animal biology. Um, and then the year after my PhD, I got a, a one year fellowship. And um, I went back to Barcelona for a bit to finish some things from a PhD. But I also visited the University of Oxford for about maybe five months. And what I did there was still wrapping up. So I was collaborating with someone there at the time. So some of it was wrapping up a paper, but some of it was also writing two grants in collaboration with this person in which I was named as a postdoc. So we wrote those two grants, submitted them. And also at the time, this person had uh, a project in Lesotho. And so I helped with the fieldwork organization and delivery of that project. So we went in, in Lesotho for two, three months and really traveled all around the country, learning a lot about the history of the country and asking people if they would be happy to donate saliva for an anthropology project, which was an interesting experience in many, many ways. Um, so still maintaining my link with Africa at this point. Two, both grants were very much focused on, on the African continent. My fascination with the African continent came part initially because, you know, we all come from Africa and I thought that was in itself an incredible, <laughs> an incredible thing. But then the more I learned about it, the more I learned about the diversity from so many perspectives and and that was just like wow there's so much we we could learn and we don't know about africa um so yeah so that's how it, it continued to be a focus on of mine um yeah so, thank you for pointing that out because i was gonna ask you why africa <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, it's, it's, it's it is you know I, I am not from africa so it's a slightly yeah. unusual uh take but um 
yeah, I, I do think that there is so much that went lost in the history of Africa that wasn't recorded for some reason, that was hidden for other reasons. Um, yeah. And I hope that we will have the space and time yeah. to rediscover yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, right, so those are figures from two the two main papers of my PhD. So you can see I did a lot of network analysis, a lot of demography. Um, so very much focused on these two bits of the genomes that have these very interesting stories that are either from, you know, the female side of the story or the male side of the story. So as you remember, I said, I wrote, I, call, I helped writing two grants in Oxford. So you would think that at that point I moved to Oxford, right? That is the most natural thing. But hey, here we have the first discontinuity in my journey. I'll call them like that. So unexpected events <laughs> that shaped dramatically what happened next. So the first grant was rejected and I found out maybe mid-2009. And then at the same time, someone in Leicester um, opened up a position, a postdoc position for five years to work on the peopling of Europe. And this person is Mark Jobling, who at the time was a very much leading person in population genetics. And I thought, oh, OK, right. So now I know that one grant didn't go in. I'm waiting for the other one. But if that doesn't go in, I haven't got a plan B. So I need to create a plan B. So I thought, well, let me apply. You know, you're, there's nothing wrong in applying. So I applied to that job and got interviewed. And within 24 hours, I got offered the position. And I still didn't know about the other grant. <laughs> So I was like, oh, OK, right, what do you do then <laughs> in this case? And I decided to drop the other grant and come to Leicester. There are many reasons why I've made that decision. It was a, a massive change of direction, but I had an incredibly good feeling about Mark as a supervisor for the next step of my career. Um, it was just too good of an opportunity to say no, basically. It was just like, you can't, you can't say no. And also, you have no certainty on the other side. So um, I found out a few weeks later that the other grant didn't get funded either. So thank God. Good call. <laughs> that was a very good call. Uh, so I moved to Leicester in 2010. And I did five years and a half postdoc with yeah. Mark. So yeah. maybe I should stop you there before you, you continue. You know, I mean, sure. you know, you've just you've mentioned that, you know, you had applied to these two grants that, you know, you are really, you know, you thought that, you know, uh, might go through, you know, and, you know, you would come to Oxford and work from Oxford. But mm. so when you got the first rejection, you know, what was what was going through your mind before you even got the application for Leicester? And, you know, like, can you speak to us about how that shifted your your uh, sort of like mindset in terms of like grant applications and applying for opportunities? Right. Um, so it's difficult to remember all the feelings, but mm. I, I, I think I kind of felt like, okay, well, there is another one. That's why we put mm. it in. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't, I don't remember feeling this is the end of the world at that mm. point. Like, like I felt in other situations later on. Okay. Mm. So I don't mm. think at that point that, because I also, you know, I just had finished my PhD. I was not even a year after my PhD. Mm. I was 20 years younger than I am now. You feel the world is your oyster. Like you feel mm. like, oh, there's going to be another opportunity. Like at that mm. point, I wasn't, I wasn't worried. Yeah. But I did feel like, okay, but on the other hand, yeah. if the other grant doesn't go in, then what yeah. do you do? Like yeah. you still need a salary, first yeah. of all. Um, yeah. And you want to do something that you like. So you yeah. better start planning now rather than let life decide for you. Yeah, that, that's that's a bit how I feel. And that, you know, when that and that was the moment in which that job was posted online. And I thought, well, I suppose, you know, that is one thing that I should do, mm -hmm. really, that, you know, so 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 basically I still kept my eyes very much open mm -hmm. about opportunities, mm -hmm. but I wasn't. 
I wasn't worried at that point. Mm. I got a lot mm. more worried later on. So the next step is a bit more complicated. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But I so, think yeah, there, are, there are points to pick from, from what you're saying, you know, because I, I think for most of our audience, it's usually people that are either done with their undergraduate or master's or even yeah. PhDs. And they are, you know, looking for opportunities here and there. A lot of them don't work out. And it's important to highlight that, you know, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> you know, there's always going to be another opportunity. And like in your case, you know, the rejection from this grant also opened, you know, an opportunity for you to consider the Leicester application. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, <laughs> you're now leading a team in Leicester. So that's that's huge. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's another continue. thing, actually, that I wanted to pick up, Ruth. Yeah. Um, so I'm a weird academic because I okay. don't really lead a team. So I've had uh -huh. a moment in which I was leading a bit of a sub team. Okay. But I've, I'm, I'm a kind of person that is trying to do an alternative um, career path within mm -hmm. academia. So I'm quite senior. I supervise students. I do yeah. deliver training. Yeah. But I, I'm a bit, I, I don't think my personality lines up very well with the role of a PI. And so I'm mm -hmm. trying to remain in academia as a senior researcher, senior yeah. research fellow, um, maintaining some leadership yeah. roles somewhat but I feel like I think I'm just I don't know maybe I'm too humble I don't know what it is but it just quite doesn't quite line up and I do hope that there will be a future in academia in which there is not only one path in mm. which there will be more paths that people can choose from because literally yeah. at the moment to be in a role like mine yeah the only real way to do it properly is to go to industry um mm. and and we can discuss later why i haven't yeah. done that yet yeah. <laughs> um, okay. which okay. yeah it's a bit unusual because it'd be much better paid to be honest <laughs> but yeah exactly. yeah okay. but there are also values so, so i have a last slide in which i summarize some of the key points that i think okay. we can then take for discussion because i think and and one of it is exactly rejections actually okay. um so yeah, all right Right, so then I, I moved to Leicester in 2010, where I still am. Um, I do my postdoc with Mark. Uh, it's a very novel project in terms of technologies. We start using next generation sequencing, so lots to learn. I started learning bioinformatics, which is not something I was very good at until then. We, we work with two other postdocs and it's a very rewarding project in many ways, quite a few publications, and it's mostly focused on Europe. But then Mark kind of indulged me to maintain a passion about Africa. So we wrote this little piece together fairly early on in that journey about what genetics and other disciplines were telling about the origins of modern humans in, in Africa. So it's a very short piece, but I really, really enjoyed writing that with Mark. So yeah, so one lesson is pick the right people to work with. They will have an impact on what you do. So that I think that's something that is hard to develop the sense, but uh, yeah, I had such a good feeling about Mark that I'm glad I followed that. So that comes another discontinuity. So you do a five years postdoc and you're in academia. And the most natural thing that people expect you to do is to apply for a lectureship at that point. OK, but I didn't want to go down that path. And so what I did was applying for a Marie Curie fellowship instead to go to Switzerland just to maintain <laughs> the geographical diversity as high as I could. So I wrote that fellowship in about a month. I submitted it. It was a very good project. And I found out four months after that it wasn't funded. So it got rejected. And it got rejected with a score of like 91.2 on over 100. So that was, that was difficult to swallow. Very, very difficult to swallow. Because basically they were telling me the project is good, but you haven't passed in that random lottery of what the threshold ends up being, you're just on the wrong side of that threshold. And so somewhat it was like, okay, well, it's reassuring to know that I did a good job, but 
I haven't got a job. So, <laughs> you know, not a great position to be. So what I did in the meantime was working part time as a research technician because we all need to pay our bills. But also I worked as a freelance trainer for an organization in Leicester, the European Bioinformatic Institute and Elixir Italy. So here comes another element of my career uh, and who I am and my profile. I love the luring training. It's something I do with a passion. I've done a lot of courses on next, next generation sequencing data analysis, and I do organize, I've organized um, a fairly important EMBO funded course in population genetics in Italy for many years. So I've done this for many, many years. And so at that point I thought, okay, right, the fellowship didn't go in. You don't want to apply for lectureships. What are you going to do next? Like, what is your next step? And so I thought, well, why don't, why don't I move into training? Why, why not doing that? And so I applied to a training job and I also applied at the same time to another postdoc in evolutionary genetics, in population genetics. And I didn't get either. So that, that was quite depressing. Uh, so, so then I found myself thinking, okay, right, this is getting a bit, I think this is a, like, it started to affect how I felt about my skills, about my capacity, about my role. And that's when you need to think, okay, well, not only you need to pay your bills, but also, you know, you need, you need to feel motivated about what you do. And so I just thought, okay, right. Things I'm trying to do in the directions that I, I think I thought were my directions are not working clearly. <laughs> like the, that, that the, the universe is telling me, don't go that way. And so I thought, well, what skills do I have? And I thought, okay, well, I, I know a lot about genomics, human genomics, and human genomics is useful in many ways. And so I thought, well, like let's just open up a little bit that search and look at jobs that would use my skills. And the first thing I did was looking at jobs in Leicester because I was based here at the, at the time. And I had personal reasons to stay as well, which is a, an important component of why you make choices. And I found that there was an open call for a genetic epidemiology postdoc in the team where I'm still based. <laughs> um, and it was closing two days down after that, the day I found it. And I thought, oh, okay, I better put an application together as quickly as possible. But I also came and talked to them very quickly because I was like, well, I'm not really aligned with the job. Like, I don't really have any evidence of genetic epidemiology in my CV. Is it even worth it? And I was reassured that it was worth it. So I applied and they ended up hire, hiring two people in that in that call. So they hired another person who was better aligned with the skills. And then they hired me for one year. And they said, okay, well, in this year, we would like to see you applying for research fellowships and we'll support you and you'll be successful. And I was like, okay, fine, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> so I joined this team here, which is a very large and successful team. And since 2016, I've been here. So I've been here initially as a postdoc, then as a Leicester Wellcome Trust ISSF Research Fellow. And then from 2018 until 2023, I had a UKRI Innovation Research Fellowship at Health Data Science Research UK. And then now I'm a research fellow in genetic epidemiology supported at, by the BRC. All of my titles have always been very, very long, which is a bit annoying. <laughs> so I'm not going to go back into the long uh, BRC theme title that I work for. But so at that point, I thought, okay, well, what, I, what it is unique about me is that I have worked a lot with human genetic diversity. And so I brought in that element. It was also the right time to do that because there was a very active con con conversation about lack of diversity in genetic studies. So that was a, a very good time. And so I worked on smoking behaviors initially, mostly. Uh, and we worked in collaboration with two cohorts in Africa. So you probably know of Awigen and UGR. Uh, 
and we studied smoking behavior. That's where I met Chisholm, in fact, uh, virtually. <laughs> but I also started working on other things. Uh, so I had I have a role in Exceed, which is a local cohort, and I work on many different kind of um, genome-wide association studies. And then I have supervised a few students by now. And in one case, for example, she has been working on pharmacogenomic phenotypes, so using electronic health records to generate um, cases and controls for pharmacogenomics, and we have applied multi-ancestry approaches. So I've brought in that kind of like population diversity experience into the genetic epidemiology 